everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is the final session of remote sensing for freshwater habitats. Um, my name is Amber McCullum. I am just going to provide you today with a few reminders about our session. And um, then I'm going to hand it over to our guest speaker, Kashif Saad from Conservation International to talk about the Freshwater Health Index. Um, so we're really grateful to have him on um, today to be our guest speaker and our expert on um, the Freshwater Health Index. As a reminder for this training, we will have three one-hour sessions. Um, we had our first two sessions on September 17th and 24th, and then today is our final session. We are presenting the same content in two different times today. Um, and you only need to sign up for and attend one um, session per day. The recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and the link to the homework assignment can be found on the course website shown here. And at the end of the session today, we'll have time for question and answer. But if we don't get to one of your questions, um, you can email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses shown here. We will have one um, homework that is now available on the course website. This will be completed via Google Form. And um, in order to receive credit for the homework, you need to complete it by Tuesday, October 15th. So that's two weeks from today. To receive a certificate of completion for the course, you must have attended the live webinars and complete the homework assignment by um, that deadline. You will receive your certificate of completion about two months after the completion of the course, so um, do please be patient um, with receiving those certificates. As we've mentioned before, there's only one prerequisite to this course, and that is um, either taking our Fundamentals of Remote Sensing course or having a um, having that equivalent background, so having the knowledge of um, what remote sensing is and um, how it's used in landscapes. And again, um, all the course materials can be found at the website here. This includes a PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. There are a link to the recording for each week's webinar and um, the link for the homework. So last week we provided a review of um, the Riverscape Analysis Project. We talked about landscape genetics and provided a little overview. And today we're really going to focus on freshwater health. So a review of session two before we jump in to session three today. Um, landscape genetics is a powerful tool to study freshwater species and their vulnerability to changing climate conditions. eDNA can be used for elusive or sensitive species to estimate abundance and to understand genetic diversity. Remote sensing, GIS, and modeling technology is, a key, is key to this multi-step vulnerability assessment. And the Riverscape Analysis Project provides information, opportunities for citizen science, and multiple online tools for acquiring and analyzing freshwater habitats in the Pacific Northwestern United States. And many of these uh, features and analysis types could be applied to different regions. So for today's session, um, our guest speaker will first provide an overview of the Freshwater Health Index and its links to the social ecological system. Um, then we'll uh, discuss how to conduct a um, FHI assessment. And um, then we'll provide a demonstration of the FIH tool and um, links to remote sensing data. We will conclude the session with a question and answer session. So, um, do feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box along the way, and uh, we will address those as we can um, at the end of the session. So now I'm pleased to hand over the presentation to our guest speaker, 
Dr. Kashif Said. Um, Kashif is the director of hydroinformatics at Conservation International and worked on the development and deployment of the Freshwater Health Index. Um, so we're really pleased um, to have you with us here today. So I will now um, hand it on over. Thank you, Amber. We'll try to cover a fair bit of ground in the next 40 minutes, including a brief introduction to the Freshwater Health Index, or FHI for short, and the tools and resources we have been pulling together for assessments of freshwater health. The motivation behind developing Freshwater Health Index was to provide a method to measure and monitor freshwater systems in a way that leads to strengthening basin management and helping conserve water-related ecosystems. I will begin by giving an overview of its structure. The first concept we have to grapple with is what is freshwater health? Health is not a very precise scientific term, but it is commonly understood as a shorthand for good condition. It conveys, to some extent, that freshwater management is not only about meeting a narrow faction of demands, but it's also about addressing a broad range of concerns involving social and ecological dimensions. We define freshwater health then as the ability to deliver water-related benefits sustainably and equitably, drawing benefits as seen in the depiction below for people. Here is a more fleshed out version of the graphic from the last slide, depicting a freshwater basin or catchment or watershed as a social ecological system. This conceptual model draws on the seminal work of Eleanor Ostrom, which we adapted specifically to the context of freshwater. The dotted line represents the boundary of a basin with influences like climate, import-export of goods, and national regulation affecting it from beyond the basin. The state of the water-related ecosystems, here in green as ecosystem vitality, controls the quantity, quality, timing, and location of water, which in turn determines the services in blue, which includes water supply itself, flood and disease regulation, fisheries, recreation, etc., that are made available to the people. Through a system of governance, seen in orange, rules are created to use the resources and in turn modified by the stakeholders. And finally, through demand, modifications can be made to the ecosystem to improve the flow of certain services. Most common example being building reservoirs to improve water supply. With this framework in mind, we can now identify the three core components of a freshwater system that should be monitored when concerned with status and trends in freshwater health. These are ecosystem vitality for maintenance of the ecosystems themselves, ecosystem services to monitor the delivery of services from water, and finally, governance and stakeholders to gauge the performance of water governance. We further break down these three core components such that each component is made up of up to four major indicators that together cover the various dimensions of the freshwater system. This structure, since it is based on a relatively robust conceptual model derived from the freshwater social ecological system, we expect to be applicable and transferable to any freshwater basin in the world. However, under these major indicators, there are several sub-indicators that are locally adaptable. This table provides some examples especially the ones we use more often and have been included now as part of the standard FHI guidance. Later in this presentation, we will look more closely at some of them, especially the ones that use satellite sense data and global models for calculation. 
This list, however, is expected to expand and adapt as FHI is applied in different geographical and managerial contexts. With the indicator structure in place, we arrive at the process of actually implementing FHI in a particular basin. The FHI assessment process is not only about generating values for various indicators, but also about building local ownership around the process and its outcome. I will go over this briefly to complete the picture of FHI application. The first stage of any FHI assessment is to define the scope or area to be covered, typically using basin or sub-basin delineation. So far, we have carried out FHI assessment by ourselves or in collaboration with partners in eight sites worldwide shown on the slide. Also showing there is the population in those basins dependent on water-related services. This stage of defining the scope also involves identifying the main decision-making spaces within a basin, the major challenges involved for water management, as well as the agencies and governing bodies responsible for management of the basin. There's an old Chinese saying about nine dragons rule the waters to describe the fragmented and overlapping institutions in water management. It's not uncommon for five or more ministries to have legitimate but conflicting jurisdiction over a water course. Water issues can be said to be often be very local, but there are also municipalities, provinces that are involved. And sometimes we who bring scientific tools are able to exert some influence in the decision-making process. Hence with FHI an important almost integral part of the process is conveying key agencies and stakeholders in setting priorities for better water resource management. With the scope defined and relevant stakeholders identified, the next step is to gather the data needed to calculate the indicators. Data from satellites may be the first stop for number of calculations or from models driven by them. This slide is actually from a previous NASA RSET webinar and may be familiar to some of you. For some of the metrics on water quality and quantity, in-situ data may be the gold standard, but data from remote sensing and numerical models are particularly helpful in obtaining spatial patterns and continuous coverage as seen in some of the earlier NASA RSET webinars. Based on the type and quality of data available, indicator scores can now be calculated. Documentation for some of the more standard indicators are now available online in our FHI user manual. And as I mentioned earlier, this list is probably poised to continue to expand. When coming to practical application, local institutions are generally best placed to carry out the calculations and verify that the outcomes are appropriate and actually make sense. And in turn, in this process, become part of the local discussions on the future of the basin. Here we see an example for the Dongjiang Basin in China, where different parts of the FHI assessment were championed by different academic and government agencies, bringing a lot of energy and consultation and expertise to the Freshwater Health Index Assessment. Weights are required to aggregate indicator scores. These and the water governance indicators in FHI are derived to perception surveys. I won't go in any detail on these in this webinar, but nevertheless, there are suitable opportunity as well to engage stakeholders in a discussion on development priorities in a basin. The final step is to put all of this together. The sunburst diagram you see on the right hand side are one way to summarize the results of completed assessments. Seen here for the Guangdu and Altomayo basins in South America. You can see the core components, the three core components, each one represented by a sunburst. 
as well as the major and sub indicators with the value of the major indicators captured through color and the weights by the size of the wedge. Reports are another way we present the outcomes and gives us an opportunity to give a more narrative description. But we are also working on animations, videos, and other media to convey the information gleaned from application of FHI in a basin. Some of these reports and animations are now available on the FHI website, freshwaterhealthindex.org. This multi-step process can be daunting for someone undertaking an FHI assessment for the first time. To help facilitate this process, we have been developing a toolbox, the first version of which was made available for public download in the second quarter of 2019 on the FHI website, so quite recently. This tool is a Windows desktop application meant to strengthen basin level collaboration and document results, as well as provide an automated calculator for some of the indicators. The tool follows the FHI template of the three core components of ecosystem vitality, ecosystem services, and governance and stakeholders, followed by the major and sub indicators respectively. It aims to help archive some of the spatial and temporal data collected during an FHI assessment, and also auto aggregate the results based on information available, as well as generating reports for wider circulation. In the next section, I will demonstrate some of these two features. And I will begin by giving a brief introduction to some of the ecosystem vitality indicators and their calculation process, and then explain our approach to ecosystem service indicators. And as I go over this, I'll naturally give a demo of some components of the tool, which you can try to replicate after this webinar. The examples I will share are also documented on the FHI website with tutorial videos and sample data sets. As I mentioned earlier, the installer of the FHI desktop is now freely available and can be installed on a Windows desktop environment ideally Windows 10. The source code of the tool is also now available and hosted on GitHub. The tutorial data made available on the website is uh, based on actual data, uh, but has been edited. And the system we have used to create this mock data set is a tributary of the lower Mekong. The system is known as the 3S system because of the three tributaries, the Seisan, Srepok, and Seikong, all starting with an S. On launching the FHI tool, a user is greeted by a splash screen and some general introductory remarks on FHI, links to existing case studies, as well as health files. The splash screen provides two main options. One, to start a new assessment by importing a basin shape file. This defines the scope of an FHI assessment. Alternately, using the menu option on the top left corner, a user can access normal file menu items like loading an existing assessment or one that is in progress. Any basin shape file can be imported into the tool, and this leads to the main screen of the FHI toolbox. The main screen, as seen here, has two parts. On the left is the three core components of FHI. Since this is a new assessment, these components are blank. Clicking on them leads to the major and sub indicators of FHI and their calculation process. The panel on the right displays GIS data added to the assessment. At this stage, since we only have added the basin outline, that's what's on display. A more populated assessment looks something like this, with scores now visible for each component and color coded. If descriptions have been added to each indicator, hovering over the score leads to a pop-up displaying the metadata. The, stools, the tool stores any information entered into it in a shareable database format. This is a file with extension .fhix. 
So for example, if I calculated only a single indicator, I can save that information as a .fhx file and share it with a colleague to edit the data or add some other indicators to the assessment. On loading a previously saved .fhx file, the indicator and the associate data load into the tool. With this general orientation, we can attempt now to calculate a few indicators using the tool. One of the most straightforward indicators that use data easily derived from remote sensing sources is the one for fragmentation of river systems. Longitudinal or flow connectivity is important for the movement of aquatic life, such as fish, and the flow of organic matter, nutrients, and sediments. Flow connectivity can be fragmented by natural obstructions, such as waterfalls, and engineered structures, such as dams and weirs. Decreased flow connectivity can negatively impact fish migration and reproduction, and may prevent sediment and other nutrients from being delivered downstream. The indicator for connectivity used in FHI is the Dendritic Connectivity Index. This indicator was proposed in 2009 by Cote et al. It uses a relatively simple principle of total accessibility for aquatic species by accounting for changes to movement caused by different barriers constructed on rivers. These structures may or may not have fish passes built into them. This ability to allow passage of fish captured by a possibility parameter, which ranges between zero to one. Zero essentially means no fish approaching the barrier can pass to the other side successfully, while one means all or 100% of the fish approaching the barrier can navigate the structure. Studies have so far shown that the best constructed fish passes are functioning at best at 60% efficiency. That is, 60% of the fish that approach the barrier can pass through it. The second distinction the indicator takes into account is the primary path of fish migration. So fish could be migrating within the freshwater body from one reach to other, or coming from outside, salmon being a common example of the second type. Without going into too much detail on the mathematical formulation, it should be noted that placement of barriers will impact these two groups in different ways. As an example, see the two depictions at the bottom left corner of the screen, where an, a barrier has been placed right at the mouth of the river. So for fish species that are migrating within the freshwater system, which are also called potadromous species, this connectivity only drops from 100 to 86. But for fish species that are coming from outside the system, also called known as diadromous species, the connectivity drops in this case from 100 to 58. To calculate this indicator with the tool, select the EV core indicator, and then in the subsequent window under basin condition, you find the connectivity option. Selecting this, would launch the workflow for calculating the dendritic connectivity index. The first step in the workflow is to import the river network. The tool supports polyline shape files and WKT format, also known as the well-known text format, to describe the vector layer. The preferable input for the vector outline is sources where the river network has been derived mathematically based on slope of the terrain model such as those made available by the Hydro Basin project. Rather than those out river networks that have been digitized from imagery. This is because while mathematically derived river networks may deviate from the river layout when compared visually, they are better at maintaining continuity of the river network. That is the most downstream end of any river segment lies on top of the most upstream end of the next river segment and so on, creating a network of river reaches that visually form the river network, but also connected to one another. Digitized images when used to derive river outlines seldom follow this logic. 
and are found to be discontinuous when examined more closely. Even with a well-formed network, shapefiles don't hold directional information. And so users have to manually instruct the code to identify the outlet of the river network. And this, when done, gets highlighted in blue. The code then uses this as the starting point and works backward along the river, connecting each river segment to the one before it to create a directional network map of the river. And if all of the reaches are connected, then it will successfully import the whole river network. And as you can see here, in this specific case, the code found 2,115 segments or reaches in the shape file that together form the river network. If the river network is discontinuous, user will get a warning at this stage. And to rectify this, uh, we'll have to go to a GIS platform to reconnect some of, or make some edits to the shape file. The next step is to import the location of the barriers. Again, a point shape file, a WKT file of the barrier location is a suitable input. The code attempts to snap the barriers to nodes on the river. I'm not sure if you can see the red cloth on the screen here, which shows one of the 59 dams that I imported in this example. If the code is unable to locate a barrier, an interactive panel helps edit the locations or remove barriers from the calculation. This happens in practice, especially when multiple data sources are combined with different projection systems, et cetera, to derive the barrier layer. With the GIS data imported into the tool, user can adjust the possibility value of each barrier and recalculate the indicator score. Also open to adjusting is the weights assigned to the different migration types. And then the score can be recalculated. It's needless to say that compared to the more detailed studies like landscape genetics that was covered in the last webinar, the dendritic connectivity index is a fairly simple approach to capture change in habitat connectivity. As with all the indicators, the emphasis is on its ability to fairly rapidly paint a picture of what is the state of the system, paving the way for more in-depth analysis where needed. As an exploration of the limits of usable insights that can be derived from the dendritic connectivity index, we use the dam development scenario for the Sesan, Sekon, and Srepok system of the lower Mekong, where dam cascades on the tree tributaries have started to significantly alter fish migration routes, in turn putting at risk the availability of fish protein, which forms a crucial part of the diet of the region. There are 66 known dams operating on this tributary system alone. And that figure may rise to 111 dams if all potential sites and planned dams are realized. Using DCI, the Dendritic Connectivity Index, we explore the impact of dams on connectivity and what it would mean to introduce well-functioning well fish passes to the connectivity overall in this cascade. This led us to the recommendation that one of the downstream dams be reconsidered to preserve connectivity in one of the tributaries. While DCI primarily relies on spatial extent and position of barriers, the indicators of water quantity and quality for ecosystem vitality require more detailed estimates of changes in water flow, for example. These can be derived from leveraging both in-situ and satellite-based observations of precipitation, land cover, and solar radiation, among other inputs that are used to force hydrological model. Ibrahim and John from NASA's Godard have been actively helping us with the work in the lower Mekong in this fashion to help monitor the flow regime through hydrological model. These models help fill in crucial gaps of data on the ground 
and compensate for insufficient coverage by local gauge data. And then the time series can be entered into the tool to calculate at least the flow deviation indicators. Moving a bit away from indicators for the surface water body alone, one of the other indicators that builds on primary products derived from satellite-based imagery is land cover naturalness, which is used to examine changes happening at the basin scale. The land cover naturalness index describes the state and trends of land use within a basin according to the amount of human-induced transformation present. A basin in its undisturbed state with intact forests and wetlands generally maintains a sufficient quantity and quality of water to support indigenous flora and fauna. Naturalness exists on a gradient from completely natural to completely human dominated. Human conversion of land and waterways are associated generally with increased pollutant loads, changes to infiltration and runoff regimes and loss of regulating services. The naturalness index is therefore a proxy indicator to the degree of which naturally occurring functions are preserved within a basin. It is based on similar efforts to categorize and quantify this gradient over landscape, such as Machado's work on index of naturalness from 2004. The input to the calculation process is a raster of RAND cover for the basin in question. To allow the mapping of the raster data, however, the user has to provide a lookup for the degree of naturalness in the table as seen on the screen provided by the toolbox. The degree of naturalness classification contains descriptions of land use and land cover types, as well as cultural practices that correspond to a naturalness weighted on a zero to 100 gradient. Subclassifications are suggested based on three factors, one of which is management of the water cycle, how much altered it is or how much it is in its natural state, pollutions or pollutants that might be entering the system, whether it be chemical or physical due to human practices, as well as vegetation characteristics, what is the degree of native vegetation, as well as permanence of vegetation cover. The proposed weighting includes ranges of values to help highlight transition from natural to transformed system. That is from forests and wetlands to cultivated lands or from cultivated lands to urban areas. It is strongly recommended that the default weights in the classification table be reviewed and based on expert judgment, adjusted to be compatible with local conditions. For example, in some regions, flooded rice paddies may be considered to have a higher degree of naturalness than other irrigated crop due to their ability to mimic some aspects of wetlands, which they may have replaced. In this case, a different classification and a higher relative weight may be appropriate. Similarly, Local or regional specific land use data sets may include highly detailed and differentiated classes of land use that will require expert judgment on the relative weight. With the table populated, import of the land cover raster completes the mapping and the land cover naturalness score is obtained. One of the main challenges in using satellite based land cover data is that some of the finer points between managed and unmanaged land cover may be lost. For example, it's common for plantations to be misidentified as some degree of forested land cover. So in both ways in updating the naturalness table, degree of naturalness table, and in cross-checking the inputs, involving local expertise improves the validity of the results. Another dimension of ecosystem vitality are the biodiversity indicators that assesses potential shifts in ecosystem functioning by measuring changes in freshwater biota. The status and trends of a basin's freshwater biodiversity signify ecosystem health with declining population of native species and increasing population of invasive or nuisance species indicating deteriorating conditions or ecosystem degradation. One of the sub-indicators we use, species of concern, includes uh, or we try to include carefully selected freshwater species 
whose status and population trends are linked to the health of the freshwater ecosystem, such that a change in the freshwater ecosystem health would result in the change in the status or population trends of the species over time. The index itself is calculated over a three-step process, where the first step can be carried out with the global red list database made available by IUCN. Although local ecologists will be the best source for information on identities and trends of such species. Moving now towards the way benefits from water-related ecosystems are distributed, in this last section of the presentation is a brief overview of the approach adopted towards assessing ecosystem services in FHI. In the slide, we can see the broad breakdown of the two major categories of water-related ecosystems. The first, provisioning services, are the more direct, tangible benefits derived from water-related ecosystems. This includes water, whether that be water extracted from the system, consumption by cities, agriculture, or industry, or water required for operation of hydropower, navigation, and even environmental flows. This component also includes biomass, fish, and other harvested from the system. The regulating component, on the other hand, looks at some of the indirect benefits provided by the water-related ecosystem services, including flood, water quality, sediment, and disease regulation. Research in quantifying ecosystem services is still catching up, and there are no current good ways to define what is a sustainable level of extracting these services. Instead, the best we can do for now is to measure the delivery of these services. We do this in FHI by framing services as a question of gap between supply and demand. So we can take each of the sub-indicators and try to estimate if the demand is being met or not. And we do this at three levels, by asking questions about the area, the frequency, and magnitude of the gap between supply and demand. Each level requires more data, and thus a better measure of the gap between supply and demand. The simplest example for this is to apply this on water supply reliability, and I will walk through the framework of the indicator using that as an example. So the first question that is asked is, how much of the region has a gap between demand and supply? For water supply reliability, this will be in the form of area affected by drought or failed supply. The next question to ask is how often demand is not met? And this is a question of frequency and require not just the area affected, but also a time series of which months or years the supply failed. And finally is the question of magnitude, which require measurements of the extent of the gap, such as supply was 15 million liters below demand for a certain month or a certain day, so on and so forth. For a number of these indicators, area and duration affected are both suitable for initial estimates to be derived from satellite-based observations or from models developed using such kind of data. And they are depicted here with that red arrow. As an example, for a more in-depth analysis for flood duration is from the work of John and Ibrahim, again from NASA Godard, who've been helping us in the lower Mekong. Here, using the same hydrological model forced by in-situ and satellite-based observation, changes to flood duration and thus gain or loss of flood regulation services from changes to flow conditions are evaluated. This brings us to a close to a very quick overview of FHI and the FHI tool. The key takeaway here is that indicator system goal is to help think of freshwater as a social ecological system and define water management goals beyond a narrow range of water requirement objectives. The freshwater health index is an attempt to move the needle in the space and draws on a wide range of products available via remote sensing, GIS, and numerical models. These, in combination with local knowledge and data, 
help communicate the state of the freshwater system to stakeholders via simplified metrics. And finally, the FHI desktop tool is a recent effort to provide a platform to calculate and collate basin level social ecological indicators of freshwater. We are continuing to refine and develop the tool. So please get in touch if you come across bugs or want to collaborate and contribute to its continued development. We also plan to continue providing more guidance on its application, both the tool specifically and FHI in general. And envision that our, as our user community grows, we will likely hold more directed webinars starting early next year on different aspects of FHI. I think I'll hand it back to Amber to for an, uh, open the floor for any questions. So thank you so much for providing uh, that overview of the Freshwater Health Index and, and being with us here as a, as a guest speaker for the series. Um, really informative and um, we, we always love having the expert with us. So thank you for that. So as we wrap up this series, a few themes come to mind um, that we have discussed through all three of our sessions. And the primary themes for me are that remote sensing is a, a tool for conducting um, analysis of water quality, habitat assessments, um, connectivity of, of these habitats, especially with fish species. Um, however, there are limitations to those data. And what we really need to compared to the remote sensing data are um, local knowledge and ground observations of, of what is, what's going on in these ecosystems and how we can relate these data um, to the remote sensing products. And so I think we saw that with today's Freshwater Health Index session. Um, and I really loved the comment about the uh, nine dragons and how um, these types of large basin studies are really multifaceted and there are many different groups that have a stake in um, these systems and eco ecosystems. Um, and we also hit on these themes with the Riverscape Analysis Project and um, how we talked about citizen science components and really integrating those local data into these larger complex models that, that include remote sensing. And I just want to thank you all for participating in our webinar series. It's really great to have you all on and uh, provide you with a reminder to complete the homework um, by two weeks from now in order to receive that uh, certificate of completion. Um, we'll now have a few minutes for um, questions. Um, if we don't get to your question or you have some other type of question, feel free to email myself or my colleague. Uh, at our email addresses listed here. You can uh, email any general RSET questions to our program manager, Anna Prados, at her email address listed here. And then again, we have a lot of different uh, webinars, a focus on land management and water resources and a variety of applications. So do um, please visit the RSET website for more trainings and more information um, about that. As you all enter your questions about today's session um, into the Q&A box, um, we'd also like to get your feedback on a few other aspects uh, of the training. So um, we're wondering if any of you out there, there are hundreds of you out there globally, um, if you've ever conducted a freshwater health assessment in the past, um, or if you expect to conduct one in the future, um, given uh, the, the knowledge that you learned today um, and the av availability of the tool. And if, if you are interested in conducting this type of analysis, we'd love to hear where in the world you're working. And in addition to that, this um, freshwater habitat training 
is um, sort of a new topic area for our land management um, area within our set. And I believe we have a unique group of participants involved here. So we'd love to hear if you have any ideas for related trainings that you'd like to see offered in the future um, that align with freshwater ecosystems or um, maybe coastal ecosystems or uh, wetland mapping or, or things sort of related to the, these combinations of land and water and interfaces where um, these themes uh, kind of travel across these boundaries. So we'd love to get your feedback on that. You can enter that in at any point in the, in the Q&A along with uh, your, your specific questions about today's session. And also don't forget, um, we mentioned this earlier, but if you'd like to reach out to any of your colleagues across the world, feel free to put your name, your email, um, your institution, what your research interests are, and um, we'll make sure to make those available. That'll show up in the, the Q&A box for you all as well. So um, thank you so much, and we'll now open it up for questions. Um, so we, we've gotten some questions along the way, and we've already started to address some of these here. Um, and I will go ahead and just hand it over to our CI um, colleagues to uh, reiterate these questions and answer them and, and talk through them a little bit. So thanks again. Thanks, Amber. Um, so the first question we have here is that, can we perform FHI for tanks, ponds, reservoirs, something of area of 250 hectares or more, and in arid or semi-arid regions? Uh, so yes, in a sense, so some of the indicators that we saw today would be directly applicable to those bodies. Uh, however, ideally for an FHI assessment to really be helpful, you are looking at the context of your uh, water body as well. So you would like to expand the areas contributing to the runoff of the surface water body, uh, like to that pond or reservoir. So you are studying the whole context uh, in which your surface body is operating. And uh, the the, the framework itself has been developed for, as you saw, the social ecological system is, is robust enough that it should uh, be able to apply in different climates uh, and different types of water bodies. The second question here is, where can you get the possibility scores for each individual dams for a calculation? Uh, that's a good question. The possibility is is something that's based on the operation of the fist pass. And so it is a relative value between zero to one, uh, zero being no fish being able to pass and one being 100% of the fish being able to pass. It's generally based on expert judgment. I've put a re reference here, Nonan et al, uh, who did a quantitative assessment on fish pass efficiency. And you may want to look at that paper to kind of help you guide with what kind of uh, values have actually been seen uh, for fish passes out there. Question number three is uh, from which year can we assess FHI of large water bodies in cases of uh, South Asia um, and the range? Uh, the baseline assessment uh, is usually dependent on the input data, and we recommend using the, of course, using the most recently available data sets uh, so that you are conducting the uh, assessment in, in context of what's currently happening and context of the stakeholders' input. Uh, but several indicators do benefit from a time series, and we generally like to think of a range of five years uh, is, is a decent range. Uh, for some of those indicators, some may be uh, longer depending on the on the context you are op operating in. Uh, is there any scope for geologists to work on an FHI assessment in the future? Uh, yes, actually. So one of the key indicators is groundwater depletion, um, and uh, this is something we have actually st uh, struggled with um, in calculating actually in some of our basins because groundwater knowledge is so uh not present on the table when we are talking to many of the watershed commissions and committees so uh it is something we we, we in the fhi it's at the moment represented by a very simple indicator uh we hope to improve that in the future 
um, and uh, we hope to get opportunities uh, to um, uh, to improve um, some of that that aspect of the work. Um, okay, why is the biodiversity section? Why in the biodiversity section the cultural assistive system? Um, Okay, maybe we need some clarification on that question. Um, but if you you can always go to our manual, uh, which is uh, freshwaterhealthindex.org/tool, you'll find much more detailed documentation of each indicator and its uh, calculation process there. Uh, and it it will give more go more into the definitions, which were probably uh, referred to very in in a very short way during the presentation itself. Uh, FHI's uh, assessments comparison to other environmental flow models uh, like ELOHA. So uh, uh, ELOHA, well, so FHI is, is more comprehensive so it, than environmental flows, but does incorporate environmental flows, uh, and it is included as a source of demand. So in to go a bit of the background, ELOHA is, is specifically a methodology developed to define and identify environmental flows for a, a particular segment of the stream, while FHI is more about a comprehensive picture of what's happening at the entire basin level. So their objectives are also slightly different, but complementary. Um, would you have us any suggestion for river habitat mapping where geomorphology is important? Drones in very detailed aerial photograph, the only way to go. Uh, yeah, we usually don't assess uh, in river habitat detail, uh, habitats directly in that sense. Uh, we do have some very simple indicators where we use um, land cover and land use data. And as you saw, the ones that we got from the satellite remote sensing are fairly coarse for habitat. Uh, assessment. Um, sorry, there's not much help there. Um, I'll let Amber take on question number eight because that's specifically to water quality parameters from satellite imagery. Yeah, so um, this question really goes back to session one. We talked quite a bit about um, certain water quality parameters like turbidity, chlorophyll A, suspended sediments, um, those can be assessed via um, remote sensing and satellite observations. Um, however, we do have the limitation of um, spatial resolution, right? We talked a lot about that. For smaller river and streams, um, we really do require having those uh, ground um, data as well. So I would uh, encourage uh, this user, this participant to go take a look at um, session one um, and um, take a look at all of the water quality parameters, pros and cons that we outlined during that session. Thanks, Amber. Um, question number nine, which deems the best? Uh, well, the one that seems is most globally available and that we use typically is SRTM for most of our work. Um, at the moment, I guess that's the most standard product for most of uh, at least hydrological analysis. Whether it will work perfectly for more for metric analysis, I'm not so sure. Um, what happens when local quality on water, uh, what local data on water quality is not available? Um, ideally, for water quality, you need in situ data. Um, in absence of which, uh, water quality modeling is an option, uh, but it would still require some calibration. Um, and it, it then starts depends on the size of the stream. If you can uh, visually estimate some of the parameters, like Amber just described. Or, or or not. There are some global models now that do uh, estimates of at least some of the parameters globally, uh, but much of that work has not been validated, but it's a good starting point. Um, I, I can look up the link and I'll add it here later for some of that work. Um, 
FHI seems to be driven by a number of data sets, which is not available. Uh, yes, so the the adaptability of the indicators comes into play here. So uh, I, the indicators we described are are generally work with quite sparse data, uh, but then they are there. That's why there are multiple levels of confidence in the indicators themselves. So if you have very low in amount of information, then you are only able to tell. Uh, a limited amount of uh, confidence in the results that you're getting through FHI. Um, and as you add more data uh, and you get more and more confident in the indicators are actually telling the story of what's happening inside the basin. Yeah, so the question for 12, is NASA planning any collaborative studies with fish freshwater biologists and scientists for riverscape level climate modeling studies? I might also refer to my colleague Juan here, who is more familiar um, with some of the projects coming out of the ecological forecasting um, program. Uh, so at NASA's Applied Sciences Division, the way in which we uh, support research is through solicitations. Um, and NASA has funded uh, certain projects, uh, such as riverscape analysis, um, to conduct these types of studies. So uh, I'm not aware of any new solicitations coming out currently. Um, we, we have had some in the past um, that where folks at NASA centers and at universities can um, submit proposals to do this kind of work. Um, but that's really the process that NASA uses in order to conduct these, these types of research. Um, we we don't have internally uh, directives to do that type of work outside of the scope of the solicitations that come through our Applied Sciences Division. Um, and Juan, if you have anything else to add on to that, uh, feel free. Okay, so um, question number 13, where do you get the drainage network? We typically use Hydro Basin uh, as a good source of drainage network because they, uh, a bit of background, Hydro Basins was derived mathematically from SRTM, uh, the digital terrain model. So they are, uh, they are uh, physically more accurate in the sense that they follow the, the flow of the terrain more accurately, even though visually they might sometimes not be as accurate. Uh, because just because of the resolution of SRTM, but they are typically the I found that was the best starting point when we are using, uh, especially trying to do some of the calculations linked to drainage space in net, uh, drainage network in FHI. The URL is in the document now. All right, everyone. So it looks like the questions are slowing down a bit, and we're um, right up on the hour. So I think we'll pause there. Um, We'll add a few links and uh, clarifications on the um, Q&A document. And as we have with other sessions, we will post this to the uh, training webpage once we've gone through it and approved it um, so that you can reference it later on. So any of those links there uh, will be provided to you. Um, we, I do also want to remind everyone, complete the homework if you're interested in that certificate of completion. Um, and those are generally sent out about two months after the training um, has ended. So um, please do be patient with those. We have a lot of participants who like to um, receive those. Um, also, we'll have the recording link um, as well as, um, yeah, so uh, uh, my colleague there has highlighted the homework assignment. So that's how you can access the homework. It's a Google form um, to complete that within two weeks by the 15th of October. Thank you all for participating. Um, we hope to see you on future RSET webinars and um, thanks again, have a good day.